Welcome to the Blue Team Village, first year. Uh, got a treat for you, uh, Chris and uh, Plug. Gonna talk about uh, how to not suck at vulnerability management. If you do vulnerability management, you know that this is gonna be a really good talk. Um, and we're gonna be talking about how to, no how to not suck at scale. So um, how about starting off with uh, some applause for these folks? Yeah. Testing, testing. Hey, thank you for coming by DEF CON. It's awesome. And thank you for stopping by at the Blue Team Village. It's the first time, so it's nice to have a lot of people here. Uh, I go by Plug, and uh, this is Chris. Hey, Chris. I'm oh, hey, I'm Chris. <laughs> so uh, the title of the talk, as you see, is How Not to Suck at Wilnet Evolution Management. Uh, so really quick, we work for Oath, which is a new company that is owned by Verizon. Uh, we officially come from a CDN portion of the Verizon Digital Media. So uh, we do a lot of stuff at scale, and I think this is the reason why we decided to do that. Um, so let's, let's just go for it. Um, uh, there you go. So to kind of set the stage, we, we need to talk about the current landscape and the reason why we decided to go about this talk. We're not going to go a lot of, you know, we're not going to talk a lot of the technical portions of the of the day-to-day -day operations, but we're going to try to ask you why you should consider the way you're running your vulnerability management program. Just learning on the spot. So um, in this case, what you see on the screen is a lot of different companies, and what they all have in common is they haven't recently been breached. What you can see in there is that these are the reasons why they got broken into, or the, or the reasons why the data was exfiltrated, or anything that happened to them that got our data exposed. So you have Apache vulnerability, you have backends that are exposure to the internet, unsecured servers, software bugs, and all of these things are fairly easy, and they could have been proactively monitored by having a really good vulnerability management program. In addition to that, Dual Labs released this uh, uh, report, basically talk about the cloud and all the findings that they have. So if you have the cloud, vulnerability management applies to you, and you should be aware of that. This is the stage, and the reason why we're doing this, because we do security, and it's very important that vulnerability management gets the right resources and the attention that it requires so we don't suck at it. Now, the one thing I really want to make sure everyone knows here is that vulnerability management is not a check mark. It's not a compliance check mark. If that's what you think it is, you're doing it wrong. Like, really, really wrong. It's not about that, it's a lot more. Now, vulnerability management is not easy. It's really not easy, it takes time, it takes a lot of iterations, and it's important you understand that because you're gonna go for a journey. Now, before we go with that, we need to set some goals. Before you begin a vulnerability, well, let's actually ask some questions. Who's doing vulnerability management here? All right, that's fair. Who does incident response or blue team? Who, who's in the blue team here? Cool, so we got a lot of people, and, and they kind of blend together. So if you're already doing a program or you're gonna begin with a vulnerability management program, what you wanna do is set some goals, and you should be very simple with these goals, and we're gonna define them, this is what we implemented. So our first goal was to have real-time identification. That was the goal. How soon can we identify a vulnerability and how fast can we triage that vulnerability? The sooner that you know that there's a vulnerability, the faster you're gonna react to it and the better decisions you're gonna make. So that was goal number one. Second goal is fast triage. Blue teams do it. You have an incident, you have to make decisions, you have to make decisions very quick. So vulnerability management teams should do it too. And it's very important that you work really close to address this. This is the portion where you're gonna invest most of your time. Finally, mitigation and remediation. What's the point on doing all of this work if we cannot mitigate or remediate vulnerabilities? Again, these are the three goals, and these are the three goals that you should consider, and you should work on your program per our recommendations. All right, so now vulnerability management comes with some challenges, and we need, we need to address those. And the first one is, there are a lot of resources from which you get vulnerability intelligence. What is vulnerability intelligence? Well, that's a thing that we use internally, but basically is any source where you can get information about a vulnerability. Blog posts, Twitter, um, mailing lists, uh, um, 
and anything else that will give you that the information about a vulnerability. So there's a lot of sources, lots of information, and to cope with that information is difficult. So that's the one challenge we have to uh, address. The second one is there will be patches that might not be available when a vulnerability comes out, or you might not be able to patch. So you have to have a strategy to how to deal with that, and you have to compensate for that. So it's an important challenge, and we're going to try to give you tips on how to do that. Now, before we go any, any further there, there is one thing I really want to address in here, which is something called Common Vulnerability uh, Scoring System, also known as CBSS. Now, this is what you see in the news all the time. Oh my god, a vulnerability just came out. 10. The thing is, you should not trust that number, and you should do a lot more than trust that number, because it's just that. It's a number, and what you need is context. Context is going to come from a lot of the things you need to understand in your organization. So use the number wisely, but don't go by it. Here's some context. Heartbleed, on version 2 of this current system, got a 5.0. Yet, most of us treat it like a 10 or more, depending. If you were to go on by the score system, you already would have done wrong, although that got a lot of hype. But there's a lot of other vulnerabilities that are on five that are very important that you might not be paying attention. Second vulnerability. Anyone knows which one that may be? That's uh, Eternal Blue. That's the one that basically allows you to um, um, use SMB, right? That's the one WannaCry used. Now, if you look into it, there are two score systems because there are two score systems you can use, version 2 or 3. Version 2 is 9.3 on the score system, version 3, 8.1. Which one do you choose? Do you go by the number and what are the, what are the conditions that you say, hey, if I pass this number, I'm going to do something? Here's another example of another vulnerability that affects um, uh, uh, email reading system in Linux. Now, there are no scores. There's information of, about the vulnerability. What do you do? Are you waiting for the scores to come in and then do something about it? So these are examples, and you can find a lot more. So please, if you're doing vulnerability management, really take in consideration the scoring system, but use it as a numerical value to aid you and provide context. If you just use that number to drive your program, you are going to do a lot of things wrong. Now, in your program, you have some uh, prerequisites, right? Things that you need to kind of have or you should have to be able to do your program better. But one of the important ones is to be able to understand your, your assets. What are your assets, your CMDB? Now, let's be honest. If you are a one-person shop, a spreadsheet is king, and you should use it and maximize it and take advantage of that. If you can, there's a lot of open source tools that you can use to your advantage, and you should look for them. Now, another thing that is very important, especially at scale, is to keep track of your IP addresses. You don't know that you might find an IP address you didn't know you own, or a block, and you might be surprised. So it's very important that you understand you keep a really good tight control on your blocks. Whether they're internal or external, it's very important. Now, if you're doing the cloud, um, when you're doing vulnerability management, you have to ask a few questions. So first of all, is the cloud a play? Do I have cloud devices? Well, you might don't think you have, but there might be someone in your organization that might have an account you don't know about and is using the cloud. Uh, then which providers do I use? Azure, Google, Amazon? Which environments are on the cloud? Because they matter. Is it the de development, the production? Uh, and then what are the accounts? This is extremely important. If you have cloud, you need to keep track of the accounts associated with you because you might get surprises and you might find an account that you didn't know it belonged to you, but one of your developers created for you. So very important information. Now, another thing that is extremely important is attribution. You find a vulnerability, you now know how to mitigate that, but I'm sure a lot of you in here have to find out who owns what, and oh my god, who's going to take care of this? So attribution is super important, right? So who owns? And who are contact? And so it's very important you keep really close um, attention to your records. And as you're improving your program, you're actually getting them better. 
But for this portion, Chris is going to talk about something else. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so just going over some of the the theory of what you're gonna what you're gonna try to do when you're when you're building out your system. So uh, you can kind of break down the things that you need to know into two categories: um, external intelligence and internal intelligence. Um, oh, <laughs> hello. Ah, uh, sorry. So yeah, you, you can break down so kind of two categories of things, like internal intelligence and external intelligence. So external intelligence is generally going to be like public stuff, so like USNs or uh, Red Hat security advisories, uh, security bulletins from Microsoft, things of that nature. You're going to need to parse them to make sense in your environment. And you're going to have your internal intelligence, which is essentially going to be you looking at your assets and making profiles upon them in some manner to, to make sense to you. That way you can relate the two together to figure out what, which ones of your things are vulnerable and which ones aren't. Um, and then based on that data, you or your tool or, or whatever you're going to do, you're going to, you're going to try to go out and drive some remediations. Um, the, the important thing, though, is to always remember that you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't get bogged down in trying to relate things together. Instead, you should try to like, automate as much as that as possible to, to make, it, make it easier. Um, so inter external intelligence, it's kind of a buzzword out there. You'll hear it other places. Um, it's, it's, it's nice. Um, be, be picky about the external intelligences that you're going to look at. Like, use the ones that are, are machine parsable, ideally, and that are, are most, most useful to your environment. Um, we're in Ubuntu shop, so we used uh, Ubuntu security notices, and we, we parsed them out, and we, we were able to like, pull some really good data out of it and then like, compare it against our environment. Um, they're, they're almost all going to require parsing of some sort, um, to, at least to you know, relate it to how it makes sense to your environment. So like, if you're looking at you know, like Ubuntu security notices, you might want to, you know, also parse various bits and pieces of it. Um, and now there's a bunch of vulnerability intelligence feeds that you can use, a um, bunch of tools. Uh, you can go direct to the source, so like Red Hat's security API, or you can, you can, you can use these tools. And then you can also, there's, there's a bunch of places you can get them, so, you know, take a look at them, peruse them, find the ones that make the most sense to what you're trying to do, and, and you know, pick one and, and start with it, and then add to it as you go on. Um, now, internal intelligence isn't a buzzword. It's something we just made up. Um, essentially, the, the most important part is that you're, you're being accurate with the data that you're collecting from your own assets and that, uh, you know, that you're, you're collecting as much as you can about it. Um, you don't want to have bad data or you don't want to be incomplete. Um, you're always going to be a little incomplete because that's just the way life is, but you want to be as complete as possible. And uh, this is really where you're going to build a lot of your integrations with other tools. Like if, you're, if, you, got, if you went out and you bought a tool for this, or whether you're like you're trying to integrate with another team or something, this is this is where like all the pieces are probably going to end up coming together. Um, now there's there's a bunch of different ways to get internal intelligence too. It's not just like oh, I'm looking at all my servers. You can grab like stuff from Windows and like your network devices, you know, your domain records, uh, things of, things of that nature. Uh, Flow data is a big one that you can look at. Um, one of our one of the guys on our team who's not in this talk, he does a bunch of great work with Flow data. Um, and you can, you can really learn a, a lot about what's going on in your network that way. So, you know, uh, just, just things to keep in mind. Um, once, you, once you have these metrics, uh, you're going you're gonna to create metrics and data based on it. Um, it's going to help you figure out what you're doing. We're kind of visual creatures, so nice graphs are great. Um, and then when you, when you have that data and you're trying to make an argument to someone to do X or Y or Z, having the graphs and having the metrics are, are going to be nice. And, you know, graphs are nice. Everybody likes graphs. Um, do try to keep in mind uh, who you're looking at. Like this graph here is an example of one that doesn't help you make your point because just there's too much there. So try to try to make it look nice because it makes it easier to, to sell your stuff upwards. Um, something something more like this. That actually, one of our coworkers, who's in the former coworkers, who's in the back, actually made this this set of graphs. Um, it was actually really helpful in, in, in getting some things actioned by the business when they could look at you know a breakdown of what these vulnerabilities were or whether they came or their categories and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, simple is good. Yeah. Wow. Sorry. All right. Let's just say something here. So, I, I want to actually add something else to that because it is extremely important. This is one of the common failures on vulnerability management your audience. We have new charts and metrics that are going to go to your whatever tier you have different tiers you have to make them count a lot so let's let's just kind of revisit this a moment if you look at this chart you have a lot of information and is that information meaningful i don't think so but this is a common mistake that i see in different places so don't don't do it 
There is no reason to have that information. If someone asks you for detailed information, break it down. But it will be much more easier to summarize this as, you know, iOS, and that's it. Maybe like the significant version numbers. Now, take a look at these other screen. It's super easy to read a lot of the important things. It's just plain and simple. What are your vulnerabilities and not everything, like the more significant, they're right there. How many of them do you have? And also, what is, what is, what is the risk on them that we pre-score? And it's super simple for someone to see, oh my god, I need to do something, or I'm in good shape. So please, do yourself a favor and do really good graphs, or pay attention to your audience, who are going to read them. These are the key for you to have people remediate things. If you don't do them right, you're not going to get to remediate things properly. All right. Let me do those, and then we'll go into them. All right, so let's talk about the tools. And as I mentioned earlier on, we have this beautiful, trusty tool, which is the spreadsheet. And it might sound crazy, but you can actually use the spreadsheet to run a lot of this stuff on your program or your program. So don't underestimate the spreadsheet because a lot of stuff you're going to be doing comes in the spreadsheets. So it's a very useful tool. Maximize it, use it, and abuse it. Now, we're getting to this interesting thing, which is scanning. And I was not going to include this in the talk, but after having conversations with our peers, I figured this is one of those where a lot of people have a lot of questions, and it's very important to address them. So here are some things about uh, tips about scanning. First of all, you should start with discovery scans. You should do them very small. Take a small subnet, do a small scan. Use very simple ports. There is no reason for you to scan 65,000 ports, TCP, UDP. Don't do that. It's going to take a long time. It's going to fail. You're not, you're not doing any, any favor. So small scans, small ports. If you, if you pass that, then use the common ports that come on Nmap um, and use them, right? Then what you really want to do in the discovery is you want to use the results to figure out what is your exposure, what you have. And then hopefully you can use that data to add it to your inventory. So you know that you're kind of diffing the data to make sure that you're discovering the things that you should have, that you have documented in your inventory or not. But the most important thing is do not do vulnerability scans the first time. Don't do that. You're going to break stuff, especially if you don't know that exists in there. So do yourself a favor, discover scans, move on to vulnerability scans. Then. I want to you to come out firewalls, and this, this one is a tricky one, but it's a very important one. Firewalls will get in your way, and you have to make decisions about how you're going to go about that. So a tip for you is set your infrastructure, and you can set a certain amount of scanners that you have to be allowed to go anywhere in your infrastructure. Then set another set of scanners that are basically facing the firewalls. Now, you might be asking, why would I want to do that? Well, it kind of gives you a lot of other visibility of things that you might not know. If you set up your scanners to go through a firewall that allows you to go through, and out of the blue you don't get data, then something is wrong with the firewall. Something changed. Now, the other way around, if you have rules that say, I'm going to block this traffic, but you're able to see it, something else changed. And that might be bad. So it gives you this extra intelligence, and you can play with that. And you can pass that intelligence to your risk response team. Because out of the blue, you may have an ACL, uh, an access list that just dropped. So very important thing. Now, I took that from a friend. Uh, recently, he did a talk at uh, Black Hat. And I really liked it, because if you're doing scans, you sometimes are praying and waiting for the scan results. So uh, I felt like it was important to have it. Um, Here's another important thing to keep in mind. And, and this is a really important question. I'm sure that all, all of you are thinking, should I do authenticated scans or not? Maybe PCI says that I should do them. You should really, really ask yourself, do I need to do authenticated scans? Can I get the authenticated scan data the other way? There are times where you cannot do that. It's not possible. But that doesn't mean you cannot actually do a really good program in manageable vulnerabilities. It's a very important thing you need to ask yourself. Finally, if you're going to implement any sort of security um, scanning infrastructure, make sure you secure that. Because that can be used for bad. So if you're going to have any infrastructure, secure it, control it. 
Uh, we can talk about IPv6. It comes with a lot of challenges, but there's a link in there that you can use to understand how do you can scan IPv6. And we can talk about it after the fact. Uh, we do scan IPv6, and it's a lot of them. So I can give you some strategies. Um, finally, we have these tool set considerations. So before before you start your program, or as you start your program, you need to t you need to ask yourself, do I need this tool, and if so, why? Now, the other thing you need to ask yourself is, maybe you have tools in your infrastructure that you can just use. Just use the data. You don't need to go and buy something. Use whatever you have and maximize the data to your favor. Finally, there are no tools that do everything. There is no magic tool that doesn't exist. It's not like you're going to go buy one tool and that's going to be your vulnerability management program. That does not exist. If there are any vendors out there that tell you that that's the case, in my experience, that is not true. You need a combination of tools, and the best, the, the, the best way to approach it is use one tool, maximize it, and enhance that with other tools. But there is no magic tool. Finally, you need to reinvent the world. There's a lot of open source tools. We're going to share one that we made with you guys today, and hopefully you can use that. Hey, hey. So uh, for when we were doing our, our vuln management uh, process, uh, one of our former coworkers he uh, he built a tool called Jellyfish internally. Um, oh, not at all. Hello. Hello. Oh, hey. Lot of sooner they say. I can do one at least. <laughs> all right. Uh, so he, uh, we built a tool called Jellyfish internally. Um, externally, we released it as Man of War um, because there's another Python tool called Jellyfish, so we didn't want to encroach on their name. Um, it's one of a number of tools that you could use to kind of manage like uh, your internal intelligence side of the house where you're grabbing like your profiles of assets and things of that nature and storing them somewhere to analyze against. Um, the open source version that we made is missing some of the helper tools because it has some business logic in there. I'm trying to get those open source maybe later this year, um, you know, when, when time allows. Um, under the hood, or we're essentially we're reaching out to all of our servers and we're, we're grabbing a bunch of data back about them and we're storing it in a database to be analyzed. Um, so the, the top one there is an example of sort of the data that we're collecting from a particular host. Um, the bottom one is an example of what we call an audit uh, that's based on a, a USN there. Um, and then there's some graphs there that don't, don't pay attention to the download graph at the end. That doesn't actually make any sense. But uh, essentially, we, 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 have, we, we went out to the USN site and we pulled down the data and we, we parsed it and then we compared it against our environment of profiles that we had grabbed. Um, under the hood, I, use, I say vectors a lot when I talk about it. Uh, you can just treat that as a crazy alien guy. Um, but uh, I wanted to shout out uh, Baron Swartz of Vivid Cortex. Uh, back in 2015, he gave a talk on his tool, Vivid Cortex, and it gave me the, the inspiration to write this part. So, um, and he used vectors in his thing. So, uh, vectors. Um, so the, 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 the getting data part of it, I call it profiling. We, we store a bunch of data about servers in like a three tuple. So we keep uh, collection type, uh, subtype, and value. Um, then we, 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 we record when we first saw it and we've most recently seen it. So we'll have like uh, essentially a first date scene and a last date scene. Um, for this tool, it's important not to record like uh, performance metrics that change all the time because otherwise you'll just be storing a bunch of different vectors and you won't get any of the benefit of storing the dates. Um, we also store IP data. Um, our network uses a lot of VIPs, so it's very nice to be able to store just a bunch of VIPs that are, associ are associated with it. And then um, we, we, we have the ability to like customize the stuff that we're pulling back. So we have a bunch of, we, essentially behind the scenes is just a bunch of commands that are, uh, bash commands that push up, pull out a piece, piece of data that makes up our collections. Um, you can see kind of an example of some of the stuff, like uh, that cpu-info is a cpu info command and like boot time is, is just, it's a parsed uh, date command that has like the, the time that, that uh, when it was booted. Um, and then like we pull it back into our, our interface and you can see the bottom one on the right there. Um, and we, we format in a nice table so if you want to go look at the stuff. And then we, we built a scheduler to go out and SSH into a bunch of hosts. We also have an agent, um, still very experimental, but it's, in the, it's actually in the code so you can take a look at it and improve upon it. Um, I take pull requests, so that's nice. Um, on the audit side of the house, this is where we're, we're grabbing data from our external sources, and then this audit part is what's kind of merging the two and doing the, the comparisons. Um, essentially, I'm, I'm breaking all my hosts out into a group or a bucket. Um, so I have a series of comparisons that decide which hosts, uh, and then I do a comparison against them um, to actually see like if it passed or failed the audit itself. 
Um, that, that's sort of the idea, ideology I followed when I built uh, Jellyfish or Mana War. Um, and uh, it works pretty well. I haven't open sourced the part that automatically pulls stuff down, so this is actually a live audit, and I had to pull out some of the stuff because it really real stuff, but it, it should be all right. You can see that it's essentially the top one there is pulling out 1404 host, and the bottom one there is doing a comparison against uh, a recent vulnerability and you know making sure that the version is higher. Um, so uh, you can also do other things in the audits, like you can tell it to do regexes or, or whitelists or, or blacklists and things of that nature. Um, so we have a few of those in there. And then we, we display the stuff. And uh, like I said, the USN scraper is still, still coming. Um, also, we built some APIs. There's a lot of APIs in, in there, so you can like integrate other tools, which we've, we've been working on. Like, we have one that's trying to like, statistically model like, the differences in our servers, uh, trying to get that open source too. But that's uh, that's still coming, and then like there's web pages to allow you to do simple searches, so you can go like hunt for like servers that have Git installed on them, or hunt for servers that have a package, or have a particular CPU type, or things of that nature. Um, and then, uh, oh yeah, so there's a lot of that Ubuntu specific logic and our environment specific logic that needs to be generalized before I can release some of the helper tools, but. Uh, Effectively, it should it should work if you write your own audits. But um, yeah, talk to me afterwards if you want to see more more of that type of stuff. Um, and then, if I were a smarter man, um, I wouldn't actually be presenting Man of War to you. I'd be presenting one of these tools. Um, specifically, Hubble Stack would be a, would have been a great fix for what I was trying to do if it had existed when I started working on this tool. But uh, there's a lot of great tools that will help give you data about your environment. Um, Catello, if you're, a, if you're a Red Hat person, like that's built into like Red Hat Satellite or, or the, the open source version Spacewalk. Um, OS Query is a great one. Faceback makes it and uses it and it goes out and grabs a lot of things. Linus, yes, at Zeus. And if you're a Windows person, uh, WSUS should give you quite a bit of data. Um, you, you'll probably have to pull things out if you want to do more of the threat hunting type stuff, but you know, it's there. Um, you're always going to need to, to customize whether you buy or you build or whatever the case is. And there's, there's no one size solution to fit all. So just you know, make sure that you, you're willing to do a little coding on the side or scripting at least to, to make it all integrate nicely. Um. All right, so that is the tool that uh, we created in-house. Now, we want to share the tool because it really allows to do vulnerability management at scale. If you do try it, it will really make sense. A lot of the stuff that we're telling you, those goals, the tool allows to do that. So one of the things that is not very clear in here is that with that tool, one of the things that we can do is an inspector vulnerability just came out. We can actually check our CPU and decide, is that impacted? And if so, how many of the servers that we have are impacted? And we can do it almost like this. So that is really good because we can actually decide how we're going to mitigate that. An Apache vulnerability comes out, no problem. We can actually do that. So find a tool. You're welcome to use this tool. Hopefully it will be as useful to us, uh, to you, than it is to us. Uh, and if you, have any from, you know, if you have any concerns, questions, or so, let us know in the back. But I want to also ask you something else. Early on, we mentioned that there are all these companies that had compromises. And all of them had also something in common. They use the cloud and some other services. So it, one of the things that you should consider is vulnerability management 2.0, which is go beyond the scanning. Do you have S3 buckets? Well, go and find them. Do you have uh, Elastic um, Search open on AWS? Go and look for it. Do you use GitHub and you might have credentials? Well, go and find them. So there's a lot of stuff that is out there that the bug bounty people do or b attackers do, and it's information that you should implement in your vulnerability management program. So and one of the most important data sets that you can have is uh, open source intelligence. There are a lot of people that are scanning the internet, right? You have census, Shodan. You don't have the resources to scan the the, your, your uh, assets externally. Get one of these data sets or get, in, get an account in Shodan and use that to check what your, um, 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 what is the word? How visible you are. Are you exposed on the internet? Has anyone scanned you and they know something about you? We're doing it. We use that data. So you should implement this in your program. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. So please do consider that. Now we're getting to this important topic, which is triage. And we're going to move really fast from here. In order for you to be effective with triage, you really need to know your software stack. This is a challenge for everyone. Are you using Windows, Linux, 
fine, now you know that. But what about the software that is installed in there? What about all the software that the developers are using? What about all the software that people are using because they're taking their laptops because they use it at home and they become an extension of their lives? What about all the libraries? You guys, you guys know that you know, when you do the library management, there are sometimes no, there are not CVEs for libraries. That doesn't exist. So it's very important you know what you have out there. Again, gonna keep going at this. CVS is a score. It's only good as a numerical value. Validate your stuff. The other thing is, a lot of these um, vulnerability reports tell you that an attacker could possibly do something. So when you read these advisories, ask yourself, is there an exploit out there? If it is, how complex is it? Does it matter to me? Am I exposed externally? How difficult will it be for an attacker to use that? Use that information to then account for the score of that vulnerability and make decisions based on that, not only on the score. Ask yourself the questions that we provide you here. Now, it's very important to do this. This is another common mistake. You get a tool, it's, it's beautiful, you got NASA, Stenable, Qualys, any of those. They give you a report, you got a list of vulnerabilities. Oh my god, you got a low tens. But then you don't know validating them. Validate your findings. Is it really a vulnerability? Is it really a 10? What if it's a 2, but it's even more important? That, that happens often. And it's very important that you validate before you go to the owners to tell them to remediate stuff. Because it, how are they going to get something that they're not vulnerable? So it's very important that you find a way to validate. One of the most common mistakes is someone finds a vulnerability on a port or a service, and they don't even connect to check that that service actually exists, or it's a valid you know, vulnerability. Super easy to do. Please do it. This is a very important thing. When you work in your triage, you need to build a partnership with your teams, the people that you work with. You need to be friends with them. You're, you're not the enemy, and you should not be one. Another very important thing that you have to keep in mind is when you're in doubt, you should ask questions. Don't ever do, avoid not asking questions. It's, the, it's the, the worst thing you can do. You are a security professional that knows a lot of stuff, but not everything. And the people that build the applications that are in your organization, they know more than you. And you are doing a disservice if you don't ask them for questions, if you don't ask things, if you don't confirm with them something. Please, don't do that mistake. Go and ask. Build relationships. Your mitigation will go way better. And you will be much more effective, especially if you're doing this at scale. We get into the remediation and mitigation. This is a difficult subject, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So sometimes uh, you you gotta interact with your organization to to get things fixed, um, and you got you have like kind of two paths. Like you have the the I I make you a ticket, I throw it over the wall, um, and sometimes you want you wanna you wanna like shame people who know your tickets. Try to avoid that because then you incentivize them to avoid the shame and not necessarily to fix the issue. Um, you, sometimes you do have to be the bad guy and call people out for not doing your stuff if you're if you're using the, the ticketing method, um, but that you know try to avoid it if you can. And then the other path is, is sort of self-service. Oftentimes, if you give your org the ability to look at some of your vulnerability data and look at some of the findings, and going back to the metrics and stuff we were talking about, if your graphs and and and, and things are, are understandable, um, you know they'll they'll go up and they'll actually go fix them for you. And like they they will preemptively like before you get to the point where you have to like go after them, they will, they will go and they will attempt to, to fix it. Uh, keeping that in mind though, accuracy is important in these things. If you have a bunch of false positives and they, they go out and they put a lot of effort in to take a look at four or five issues and try to go fix them and then they find out, oh, they're all false positives, they're probably going to stop looking at your stuff. So, you know, if you want to go the self-service route, you have to make sure that, you know, your accuracy is, is right and that the bones you call out are actually real and actionable things. Um, and then, uh, so, some of the questions are like, should you remediate it, like, like going fixing the root cause, or should you do some mitigation? Um, sometimes it's, it comes down to like, what, what can you do? Like, oftentimes when you're doing vuln management, it's, the answer is going to be patch. You know, nine times out of ten, if you come across a, a vulnerability, the answer is going to be patch. Um, but sometimes you can't patch for various reasons. In that case, you're going to want to look in the remediations. Um, 
And then uh, document your decisions, um, not just because you can like hand that to an auditor, and all the auditors do like it, but also because when you add new teammates, uh, you can you can give them your your list of your your repository of documentation, and then when they're wondering about how you did X in the past, they can go just search and look at it, and it makes it easier to kind of record what you did in the past and how well you did, and then to sort of kind of iterate upon it and, and get better each time you go through it. Um, I think this one here. Yeah. So this one is very important, and it happens to all of us in security. And the, the reality is that one day, one day things go horribly, you know, things go bad, really, really bad. And the advice that we have for you is very simple. If things go bad, first, don't panic. You're not the only one. It's bad. Two, don't shame. Don't blame anyone. Don't play that game. It doesn't work. The most important part is that find out what was the cause and do lessons learned. That is critical for you. When you're doing your lessons learned, it's very important that, again, you don't panic and you don't shame. If you do that, you're going to learn from the mistakes and you're going to be able to get better at what you do or what we do, which is securing things. Again, that applies to everything, but one day, one thing is going to go horribly wrong and just keep this advice in mind. Now, there are some next level ideas. Let's say that you, you, many of you maybe are doing already all of this, and you feel like, well, this is nothing new. I already am doing this. Well, we're going to give you some next ideas. You know, what can you do to increment and to make your vulnerability management program better? Well, why don't you gamify your program? I mean, we have CTFs, right? People are capturing the flag. Well, why don't you capture the vulnerability if you remediate? There's things that you can actually do. You can create scores for teams, the ones that are doing better. Everyone loves swag, right? I mean, some of you got swag in here. Don't you think that the people that are remediating the vulnerabilities want swag too? Well, they do, and if you do it, they're gonna love you, and they're gonna want you to patch faster. So if you can, I'd recommend it. Now, let's say that you're already doing that as well. You really want to get into the automation business. It's really going to make your life super, super easy. Not all the time, but it's going to make it fairly easy. So look into orchestration tools that can actually help you and do that. If you don't have orchestration tools and if you work at a scale, it's very likely that you already have some of that. So take it back on that. Don't build your own stuff. Just use what they have already in place and use it to your advantage. It really pays off, and you can use the bandwidth that you have to do something else more meaningful. Now, what about advice? If you do orchestration, you have to secure your pipeline. If you don't do that, it could be misuse. If you use Jenkins and some other tools, there's a lot of vulnerabilities. So make sure that when you're addressing vulnerabilities, you address your own, and that that environment that you're using is actually secure. So keep that in mind. You pass that and you're ready to go for the next level. So you can actually do more bounty. Now the balance in here is this. If you don't have the basics, which we covered early on, right? So we'll see how to do some basic uh, way to triage certain things and to respond to the game, do not do bug bounty. It's not for you, you're not ready, wait for it. It's gonna be painful and it's not gonna be really uh, a good business decision. Now if you are ready, but be ready to get a lot of work and be ready to take some cycles off of your regular pipeline to address all the vulnerabilities that will come up from these reports because you will get lots of reports. So you know, evaluate, make a decision, but if you're ready, Bob Bounty is highly recommended. We're about to finish this talk, and this is one of those things that comes up often, which is how should I not measure my vulnerability management program? Now, this is a difficult one because there's no magic bullet. There's nothing that tells you how you should do that. But early on, we talk about the three primary goals that you should set, which is how fast can I respond to something, my triage, and my mitigation. You should use those three goals and any of the data in there to drive you to score how good you're doing. Anything else doesn't matter. I will say that the most important thing to measure your program will be how good are you at triaging things. The rest will come up easy. Triage is very important. It's the key to you to be successful to address things. 
So remember, there is no magic bullet on how to measure your vulnerability program, but you should find a way to do that. And you should set goals to improve, improve, and improve. And with that, we're going to get to the end of the talk. Sorry. So uh, yeah. So the, these are the final takeaways. If uh, if uh, if you you know just kind of spaced out for the rest of the talk, the, these are the things we think you should you should use to like try to avoid shaming. Um, work with your orgs when you're in doubt. Go ask them. Um, don't blindly trust upstream scoring. If you are going to rely on CVSS scores, uh, try to please make sure to use the the uh, the temporal and the environmental scores. Um, and, and those scores will change over time as you know t time changes and as your environment changes. Um, validate your data, make sure it's good, um, and improve incrementally. It's okay to not be great the first time around, just, you know, get better every time you do stuff. And the most important part is that uh, if you're doing vulnerability management, like, you are one of the most important assets, so don't get bogged down in doing, in like, looking at, like, one vuln that you can't quite figure out. Uh, you know, you got to stick and move sometime, get a little Muhammad Ali going. So, uh, I think that's, that's it. Um, we're going to be in the back taking questions. Uh, I believe we'll probably be out by the bar. So, you know, um, meet us there. Thanks.